All right, hello everyone, and welcome back to another edition of The Less Stressed Life, where we teach exhausted and burnt out adults the truth about adrenal fatigue so that they can get their health back quickly. And I'm really excited to interview my next guest because I've just seen him ascent through the rankings and, and relevancy of the world of biohacking. Lucas is a Australian leading biohacker with over seven years of experiencing, researching and experimenting with nootropics and other performance enha enhancing compounds. Uh, Lucas Owen is extremely motivated to discover something big for science that can benefit millions of people globally. I love that. Lo Lucas also offers cutting edge health content ranging from nutrition research, hormone research, nootropic research that 99% of the world has never heard of. And we'll have the firsthand in information from Lucas today. Lucas thrives on offering insanely valuable content on a global scale. And Lucas, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, Joel. Um, yeah, very, very stoked to be here and can't wait to chat. Yeah, I mean, listen, I remember it was a couple of years ago where you sent me an email or a, a DM and I'm always excited to help anyone out that has a um, an interest in learning. I, I never look at it as a lack mentality whatsoever. If I can help someone else that would help someone else, I, I don't feel like that's infringing on my space. And I'm actually glad that I did because, you know, it goes to show you, you, you reap what you sow and, and now you get contact with someone who's moving up through the ranks and you created good karma with that person. Yeah, it's funny. Um, just how like, just out of keen curiosity i reached out just to ask you a few questions and now like ever since then it's snowballed and now i'm just doing what i love every day which is which is awesome yeah excellent so why don't you tell us a little bit about your story lucas because a lot of people that get into this space have their own hero's journey or what they've been through and i think it helps our listener understand that there is possibilities of getting health back and then using your challenges to make your your armor um, that much more fortified um, but why don't you tell us a little bit about your own background and what some of your own health challenges may have looked like yeah, sure. I mean, my journey really started out um, playing uh, professional soccer. I was always focused on the performance enhancement side of things, how I can improve my performance on the soccer field. Um, and then just sort of from there, I ended up studying exercise science um, and fell in love with like research. And then obviously, um, I also fell in love with experimentation and seeing what various um, supplements and various protocols were doing to my biology. And then from there, basically just um, transitioned out of that exercise science degree and started uh, studying naturopathy. So like a four-year degree uh, here in Melbourne, Australia. And yeah, just really um, gained a lot of traction through, you know, researching more about herbs and supplements. And um, I just fell in love with the fact that we can absolutely take control of our biology. And then, yeah, that's that's been my my sort of mission is to set, help share that what I've learned and all of this underground content that I research, my mission is really just to provide people with what I see. I've, I've always been, I basically live by the premise of if you know something that can benefit millions of people, there's no point withholding that information. You might as well just get it out there and just spread the message. Um, Cause as you know, like you spread good vibes, good vibes come back to you. So yeah. Yeah, for sure. I've found that that rings true a lot with people that either are insecure or have their own challenges that they don't want to share information. And you're right, it, it does create a, a reciprocity to bring more into your life. But I'm just curious, so for more for performance enhancing and your own athletic adventures, were there any ever challenges with mental capacity or learning or just energy or fatigue at all for yourself, Lucas? Yeah, I mean, I did also struggle with um, acid reflux for many, many years. And my dad's a pharmacist. So I sort of thought I was privileged in the fact that I could get away with the reflux using um, proton pump inhibitors or Nexium medications just to suppress the um, reflux. And that's actually really what catapulted me into learning more about um, physiology and things like that and learned that 
you know, it's doing a great job at suppressing symptoms, but then it was leading to B12 deficiency. I had low iron um, and then all these other negative symptoms of like um, correlated with like low iron and things like that. So that's, that really did affect my quality of life. Um, and then really just was profoundly fascinated by, you know, I first trialed like one particular uh, compound L-theanine and I tried that before one of my soccer matches and noticed that that was having a dramatic effect on my performance on the soccer field. And I was like, hmm, what else is out there? Like, what else can I exploit and explore um, to benefit my um, existence, basically? Yeah, no, that's cool. It's, it's interesting being the son of a pharmacist, how you would have almost inherently that susceptibility to want to see how compounds impact your body. But you've taken that other fork in the road and you're going more of the holistic ergogenic way of helping your body. So how does dad feel about what path you've taken and what path he's taken? Um, to be honest, at the start, I think he was a little bit like um, skeptical and um, questioning whether there's any research or evidence for natural modalities and things like that. But funnily enough, I think two years into my degree, I actually got him off his medications um, he was on reflux medications himself and I ended up, you know, formulating various bitter herbs and, and bitter particular stacks, which I think now looking back to very, very basic. Um, but since then he's, you know, he's been, he hasn't used his reflux medication since. Um, and I also worked in the pharmacy as well. Like I, 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 I worked there for like four to five years. So I understand what it's like to be in that environment. And without a doubt, it's been super beneficial for my own, growth and i'm again i'm not although i am studying you know naturopathy and holistic medicine i'm still you know i still will look at how they do things and utilize those modalities where where necessary um like i'm not one of those hippie naturopaths that's like you know just just herbal medicine and that's it like i think there's a time and place for both for sure yeah, I mean, and that's where the word ergogenic comes into play, right? So why don't you tell our listeners, the CEO and founder of Ergogenic Health, what, what ergogenic means and what ergogenic health stands for? Yeah, so the word ergogenic basically just refers to any technique, substance or protocol that can improve physiological or psychological performance. So it's very much based on less so about the disease and sickness model, but how can we take someone who's already quite healthy or performing quite well to perform even better and feel even better? It's sort of like enhancing your quality of life. So really that word ergogenic, I fell in love with um, when I was doing my own research. I was like, damn, that's a really cool word. I really want to use that. And then I just, I, I use that as my business name, ergogenic health. So really I try and tell people that my business is not, just focused on you know the disease sickness model but more about promoting vitality wellness and quality of life yeah yeah and you know what's so great about that too is because i happen to have my own health story of fatigue and exhaustion and burnout and i discovered that doctors don't believe in this phenomena and they black and white it as it's either or it isn't and i had to go through my own journey to get my health back so the people that i help are typically those type of people that are exhausted and burnt out. But what I love is the idea of for people that are looking to already improve their performance, um, who like dedicate years and decades to the difference. I can't remember what comedian it was, but they imagine like, imagine in like the hundred yard dash where you train forever and it's like this, this, like you were this, this behind, you know, and ergogenic could be the difference between a gold medal and not, but ultimately extrapolate those concepts, Lucas, to people that are exhausted and burnt out and still get the benefit and that much even more because they have such a weakened, debilitated starting point. So why don't we transition into that? Because I'm really excited to talk about that with you in terms of what some of these novel um, ergogenic and or no nootropic uh, supports you have. So why don't you start with nootropics and what does that word mean for perhaps the listener that I know your listener knows it and perhaps my listener knows it, but some of us don't. So what exactly is it? Yeah. Um, so just firstly, what you mentioned about 
um, that 1% difference, I think that's absolutely true. Like it definitely needs to be um, taking into account the fine details. And that's where I really think some of these compounds can really help. Um, and so the word nootropics basically refers to uh, any compound, either natural or synthetic, that can improve any aspect of cognitive function. So um, that can be a compound that improves memory, concentration, alertness, motivation, reduce anxiety, all of the different aspects of, you know, cognitive performance. And so like the very, probably the most well-known quote unquote, like nootropic would be caffeine. Um, caffeine, your listeners will know a lot about caffeine into from an, an adrenal fatigue perspective. Um, but we do know a lot about how caffeine acts in the brain. And we do know, you know, quite well, which receptors it binds to and activates and triggers so caffeine is technically, yes, it's a nootropic, but there are other nootropics that, are, that can um, deliver that energy boost and improve alertness without the side effects of the increased blood pressure, raising cortisol, um, you know, and, the, and the withdrawal and tolerance, which is, you know, there's, there's so many compounds out there. So then does the word nootropic then encompass the fact that not only do we want to take this natural or synthetic compound and improve physiology 1% or more, but we also want to minimize or eliminate or not even have those negative side effects? Yeah, yeah. As part of the official definition for, for nootropic, there's like five key criteria um, that's established by a Romanian pharma, uh, chemist, Corneliu Georgia. He stated like five key criteria the first one is that they have to improve learning and memory. They have to protect the brain against various um, chemical stresses. They have to protect the brain against um, physical uh, toxins. And they also have to be free of the typical side effects associated with um, psychostimulants and um, like depleting compounds. So you can sort of see how nootropics are there as like neuroprotective they're compounding they actually lead to a better brain better brain function and better brain infrastructure over time whereas compounds like um uh certain stimulants and things like that they can they can actually rob from tomorrow so they're actually not nootropics because they're actually depleting um the body's resources Right. Okay, great. So what I love about that also is because I like that concept, especially for biohackers, they don't seem to be as hippie ish in terms I mean, I'm more of a hippie, right? So but they don't seem to be as hippie ish in terms of, hey, if it's a nootropic, and it's synthetic, but it fits the definition of those five key things that you mentioned, and it actually doesn't create negative effects then what's the problem? And I agree with that I, to a certain extent. I mean, I can't prescribe in that capacity, but I would agree with that in terms of if we can harness not just nootropics, but medications that are out there that have different nootropic effects, then we can kind of biohack um, in a way that is, is ultimately helping our body. So why don't you tell us your definition of what, what it is to biohack? Yeah, I mean... I was just thinking of a, a key sort of um, foundational aspect there. Like the whole premise of biohacking for me is to utilize um, various aspects in your environment and utilizing resources to improve your quality of life. Um, so looking at it as like, you're just every day, you're implementing one new strategy to improve your baseline. Like you're just your baseline state of functioning or being. So um, and that can be broken up into various categories, you know, biohacking sleep, biohacking digestion, basically just means optimizing um, your quality of life. But really, I think the key point is that we're building upon an infrastructure and we're building a foundation that's getting stronger and stronger and more robust over time. Not that we're utilizing things that are um, acutely going to give us an increase in performance. But then tomorrow we're actually 50% below baseline. I don't think that's true biohacking. I think true biohacking is using um, strategic use of uh, various compounds and, and protocols to just facilitate the progression of mankind. 
Yeah. Right. Well, and I think strategic is a really important term because it's not a linear one is good. A lot is better. It, it's a, it's a Goldilocks of not too little, not too much and really understanding all of the physiology and the environment to be able to get the best, response from things so why don't we like listen fatigue and exhaustion and brain fog and not being sharp on the ball and being overstimulated and can't turn the brain off and waking up in the middle of the night um so how would let's get into what word you told me when i was inter being interviewed by you which is like what what is that so cosmetic neurology i think that's an awesome term so cosmetic neurology adrenal fatigue brain fog nootropics Let's start with however you want to start with in that area, Lucas. Yeah, so cosmetic neurology is a term that basically um, looks at how we can manipulate our neurotransmitters to suit our needs for a particular um, activity or task or environment. So the way I look at it is the perfect example is like, let's say somebody um, is going out you know, to a party or an event or a dinner or something, and they need to be in a certain state of being where they feel not anxious, they feel disinhibited, they feel free flowing and almost like in a joker slash sarcastic um, uh, attitude sort of state of mind. Um, so that there is like, okay, well, how do we, if somebody wants to feel like that when they go out, and they want to be on point and sharp and funny and witty and maybe sarcastic. What can we do with our neurotransmitters to actually facilitate that outcome? Like what is happening in the brain to actually, you know, come across like that to other people. So that's where understanding um, cosmetic neurology and neurotransmitters really comes in is that what happens when we increase GABA, we see a reduction in um, anxiety and reduce stress what happens if we increase dopamine we increase confidence we increase motivation alertness um so sort of like merging all of that and just it's really just taking control of our um almost like our personality in a sense yeah and and i think it's really important to say that with the demographic that you work with you have a tighter control in what you could implement and what kind of response you can get versus you know, the people that we work with, there's too many confounding variables where we aren't controlling for just implement this and see the result because there, I mean, everyone has those confounding variables, but when we're talking about blood sugar balance, inflammation, already sympathetic wind up, um, microbial overgrowth, circadian breakdown, I mean, all of these things have to be taken into consideration with, with your demographic too, would that be correct? Oh, for sure. And that's where I say like um, nootropics can be very, very powerful and they can be life-changing, but really they're just the icing on the cake. It's like, if you've already got your foundations right, like you're looking after your exercise and you're addressing sleep and diet and avoiding toxins, things like that, you've, you've built yourself to a point where your foundation's strong but now you're in a different territory. You, you, you look like you've been there for three years. You've built yourself to a point. Now you just want to like go that extra 10 to 20% and just be absolutely just dominating. Almost like just, yeah, just really just um, smashing life. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get into that. So um, cosmetic neurology, what give us like 101. So how as um, a, um, you know, clinician, or a biohacker, or just supporting one of your clients, how you would go about, you know, implementing your strategies? So the first thing I would do is get the person to ask, ask themselves, like what their goal is, like, what are they trying to achieve? Where are they trying to perform? And let's say, for example, um, they really want to hijack their motivation network. So like they want to take control of their motivation, drive, alertness, that sort of aspect of cognition, which is a very common one, by the way. A lot of, a lot of people do struggle with that motivation, alertness. They, they procrastinate. They just can't get shit done. Um, that seems to be a common theme amongst a lot of people. And so when we look at 
integrating cosmetic neurology here, we need to first address the primary neurotransmitter that, that governs those aspects of cognition, which is uh, dopamine, noradrenaline, adrenaline, acetylcholine, um, and histamine. So if we increase the synthesis of these neurotransmitters, there's a good chance it will help your brain um, perform that task in the best way possible. So there really is like a range of um, novel uh, dopamine boosting compounds, which I'll be happy to explore if you want me to dive deeper with, with some of those novel compounds. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. I, I like the concept of when I'm working with clients that are exhausted and burnt out, they don't have motivation. They don't have drive. They potentially have ruminating thoughts. They're waking up like a fire alarm is, is getting them at, you know, 3 a.m. in the morning and someone's beating a drum right by their head and they wake up in a stupor and their heart rate's elevated. So yeah, take us through what um, be, beyond the foundational stuff and asking them what their goals are and then figuring out what the main transmitters are that are responsible for hijacking. I love your terms. Awesome. So hijacking your, your motivation system. Um, yeah. and, you know, so what, what do you go, what do you do about the path that you set once you've hijacked the, the cockpit? Yeah. So once we've like hijacked the motivation network of the brain, um, First, we need to understand now um, what can we implement that's going to lead to a sustained increase in that neurotransmitter. In this case, it's dopamine. Instead of using the precursor compounds, which you know they do work up until a point like tyrosine, the amino acids, and phenylalanine, and B6, and B5, and B1, instead we can use um, something known as um, bromantane. Bromantane is like one of the world's first synthetic adaptogens ever developed. Um, it was actually used to treat um, neurasthenia, which is just like general weakness and fatigue of the body and mind. Um, and originally it was sort of deployed for um, the Russian military and Soviet cosmonauts to combat stress. It was really seen as like a um, anti-stress, anti-fatigue agent. Um, and of course, when I did my research, I was digging deeper into the clinical studies and um, I saw that there was like a robust improvement in many aspects of vigor, vitality and fatigue. And the best part about it was that there was no signs of um, tolerance, withdrawal or um, sensitization. That was the key point. I'm like, well, if we can find a compound, anything like caffeine can do that, but there's signs of tolerance. There's signs of withdrawal. It's depleting to the to the adrenals. It's depleting to dopamine long term. Whereas bromantane actually hijacks that enzyme, tyrosine hydroxylase, the enzyme that actually converts the tyrosine from our foods into L-dopa and then dopamine. It actually upregulates that enzyme so that we're getting, and that's the rate limiting enzyme that actually produces dopamine. So if we're getting a sustained upregulation in that enzyme we're actually leading to a, a sustained increase in dopamine and we see that with you know i see that with clients i've seen that with um athletes it's unfortunately it's now banned by water because it's so effective um but yeah bromantine's really a novel uh, nootropic that really does tick a lot of the requirements to improve motivation drive and yeah general vigor so how do you spell it? Because, you know, bromatane, I, I honestly haven't heard of it myself. So I, I always like to do these podcasts because like, yeah, that's a new one for me. So, yeah. So it's, um, it's funny because it's got two of my, it's bromantane. Um, the, the, the actual uh, Russian like name is Ladastin, L-A-D-A-S-T-E-N. Um, and it's been around for, I think, 40 years or so. Um. And yeah, as I said, it was really just developed to treat um, neurasthenia, which and general weakness of the body and debilitation and recovering from severe sickness. Um, so it's not actually it's not a prescription um, drug. It was at, at its time, but it's now available for public use as like a supplement. It's sort of in a gray area with some of these nootropics and supplements. It's sort of in a a gray area. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, based off like preliminary studies and how people respond to the compound, it does seem to be a viable, just one of our many tools in our toolkit to improve someone's quality of life. Um, yeah, and I think that's key is a tool in the toolkit, right? Because you're not going to use the hammer for when you need to do a screwdriver or you're not going to do a hammer when you need the saw. And I think that's where we exhaust the utility of a nutrient. So what would be your recommendation? Okay, someone is lacking motivation and drive and focus and not getting stuff done. How would you implement the dosing strategy for that? Sure. So what I found was actually less is more with this particular nootropic. Um, and that is because not only does it increase dopamine, but it also inhibits um, GABA transaminase, which is the enzyme that degrades GABA. So most people, they're silly. They think uh, more is better. You know, they, they, I see this all the time with like nootropics. Oh, if a little is good, more must be better. Um, that's not true. And it's partic particularly shines with bromantane. Um, so because it, it inhibits that GABA transaminase enzyme, we're actually going to increase GABA tone as well. So we're going to get like that anxiolytic effect as well. Um, but we don't want that to be overpowering because too much GABA can be too calming and sedating and relaxing. Um, so a particular dosage protocol that works well for most people is about 25 milligrams orally um, first thing in the morning because it has a really a very long half-life and it and its peak serum concentration is like four to six hours after dosing. So it doesn't actually really quote unquote like kick in or you don't really feel the alertness and focus um, immediately. It's more of a delayed effect. Um, and as with all supplements, all nootropics and all compounds, this is just like every other one. It needs to be cycled. Um, it's not something you'd want to take daily, every day. You might want to save it for the days that you want to really work hard or you've got a lot of public speaking to do. Um, so like five days on, two days off would be a, like a, a viable strategy. Um, it's not medical advice, just a heads up. Uh, right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, whenever that should be a disclaimer anyways, is that we are giving nutritional advice to improve function. And obviously we are allowed to do that under the FDA as a food to improve function, but this is not medical advice or prescriptions for people to go out and say, this is what the doctor said. Um, so as far as, so, okay. So um, five days on potentially two off when you're wanting to uh, elicit a, an effect for motivation and, and getting stuff done. Um, do now, have you seen this with um, a lot of your clients or a lot of people you work with or, uh, or just more researched on your own? Uh, I have worked with um, some like executives and like um, entrepreneurs that, that need support um, personally, but really, it's all on my, um, like the feedback has been mostly through my YouTube videos. Um, I did a, you know, a comprehensive video breaking down um, Bromantane to explain how it works, its pharmacology, pharmacokinetics, things like that. And really the feedback has been, and across the board, you know, if you go on various forums and things, I would say 80% of people respond quite well to this compound. Um, there is, you know, I, it would be irresponsible for me to just explore the benefits and not explore some of the downsides um, and side effects. So I will also present that because that's important. Um, so one of the drawbacks that people will discuss and complain about is one particular rat study that says that it may increase amyloid plaque in the brain. But if you look closely, the dosages that they used were ridiculously high um, and it's unlikely to actually occur in humans. And even if it does slightly increase amyloid plaque, if you compare like exposure to the toxins in our environment versus this, like be, going outside and smelling an exhaust fume is more likely to trigger amyloid plaque than a compound that's designed to be neuroprotective, you know, so. Right, no, absolutely. Uh, so, okay, so as far as... Um, other cosmetic neurology and novel nootropics. Um, what other what what other what are what other things you got in your bag of tricks over there? Um, so one 
one compound that I like that's neuroprotective, but then also relevant to like an adrenal fatigue picture, which I think would be cool to explore is um, a particular seaweed called Eclonia carba. Um, it's a brown algae seaweed that's got, I mean, I think the Japanese spent over $30 million researching this particular seaweed. Um, and it's, so it's not so fringe and underground. Well, actually it is, it's underwater, not underground. Um, but, but Eclonia carva is, I, I think, an absolute powerhouse in terms of its antioxidant capacity. It completely obliterates vitamin C, vitamin E from its antioxidant perspective. And it also um, increases alpha waves in the brain, similar to L-theanine, which is found in green tea. So it gives you that um, calm, relaxing feeling. It also lowers cortisol. It improves um, acetylcholine production. So most people notice much more um, vivid dreams and better memory performance when they use Eclonia carva. Um, and it also has a really potent anti-anxiety action as well. And it does this yet again in a very sustainable way. It increases, um, it basically increases the ability for GABA to bind to its receptor. So it's a GABA A positive allosteric modulator. So it opens up the GABA receptor, makes it more receptive to your body's own GABA, which is great. Like we want something that's going to work with the body and not rob the body. Um, so the Clonia Carver really shines. Like you've seen, I haven't done a video on it yet. I haven't done, I haven't really spoken about it much just on a few podcasts because it's, um, I will be soon, but it's, I think it's a really powerful uh, tool yet again that we can utilize. Yeah. I mean, I see a lot of clients that have had major challenges with the benzodiazepines and um, the colonzepans and stuff like that, where they were on it for so long, Lucas, and now it's really created a lot of plasticity and just feedback issues and major anxiety concerns. So I don't know, have you seen any research on that for helping people through withdrawals or just kind of remodulating? Cause that would be helpful for some of the people I'm working with. Oh, for sure. Um, so that's actually something I do cover in the nootropics course. There's one element of that, which is like, how do we upregulate the GABA receptors that have been so heavily downregulated from benzos and, and Valium and compounds, which is again, millions of people struggling with this problem. And so they're either in withdrawal, they need Valium benzos to sleep and or without it, they're a mess. Like they're literally anxious and life is extremely difficult. So um, there is another compound, um, the Clonia Carver is one that, that can definitely help with that GABA tone. Another one that works quite well to upregulate um, GABA receptors is actually one called homotaurine. Um, it's a pretty, pretty wild, wacky name. Um, it's not, it's got nothing to do with sexuality at all, but they, they, they named it homotaurine. Um, and basically this this is found in a different type of seaweed um, and it's used to, so basically it's a GABA B antagonist. So it actually blocks the GABA receptor. So literally when you take the compound, it will put you almost put you into a state of um, benzo withdrawal. So it's literally like you're taking something to feel worse, um, but then it has a rebound effect the next day where you get that sustained upregulation. So it's almost like, and this is a quote I haven't used on any podcast yet, but it's anti-endocrinology. So it's like anti, it's anti-endocrinology. You're literally doing the opposite of what you want first to then rebound and come back up to get that response that you're looking for. Um, yeah. I yeah. mean, I think some medications work that way too, though. No, I mean, in terms of Adderall and stimulants where if someone's already producing too much of that they give more to inhibit the production is it along the same lines yeah sort of i think that there um yeah that's like it's almost like a double double a double double a, a double positive to make an, a negative or a double negative to make a positive um yeah yeah you're right definitely right well so it's, it's adaptogenic at the end of the day right i mean if you're resetting the 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 receptors 
um, and you're kind of like doing the fuse breaker, right? Like you're, you know, when you're, when you're, you trip a fuse and you need to reset it and turn it on and turn it off. And I think that's the way my mind works, Lucas, in terms of that's probably the best. I'd be concerned with some of the clients that I've, I've seen, unfortunately, for 10 years or longer, when it shows that that shouldn't be used more than so many days. I mean, I don't know what happens there, but I'd be concerned of, having them go through more withdrawal because they're already going through withdrawal. But if, you know, what do you, what's your thought on that? In that scenario, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't veer towards something as intense as like homotaurine, but instead I'd use something like um, BPC-157. We've seen some, and I'm sure you've, you've heard about BPC-157. Um, that there, I mean, that there has, there's countless reports online of people recovering from um, benzo withdrawal using BPC seems to have a very stabilizing and rebalancing effect on the brain. It does have some degree of affinity towards the GABA network, but the thing is, we just, we just don't really know how BPC-157 works, but it just seems to help to recalibrate the brain. And um, usually with my own endeavors, if I've, because I like to experiment and, and a lot of the time, if I've accidentally, Accidentally, if I've accidentally set myself down the wrong path, as in like I'm too anxious and I'm, I actually feel bad myself, oftentimes I'll resort to BPC just to correct things and then I'm back to, back to good again. Like I'm just back online. Um, but yeah, be, between BPC-157, um, there's other... I think taurine by itself can do quite a good job. Um, and again, it's sustainable... It's um, non-toxic, you know, within even at high doses, it has other pleiotrophic effects beyond just the brain. Um, and it, it does have a, does do a pretty good job at reducing anxiety um, for a lot of people as well. You know, it's interesting as you say that because I, I study a lot of the functional genomics and I think about that whole transsulfuration pathway where we're looking at um, ultimately taking homo, another homo name, cysteine, and I guess it's just one, one taurine molecule or one cysteine molecule, um, and they call it homo, um, homocysteine or whatever. But anyways, what they do is um, there's a lot of Plinko chips that can go down the wrong pathway depending on if there's inflammation, if there's enzymes that are inhibited because of heavy metals and so forth but you see sulfites and sulfates and glutathione and taurine, they all go down those pathways. And my hunch is maybe you can confirm this or not, that when you do have those inflammatory mediators signaling things down the wrong pathway, perhaps BPC gets that more modulated, but not only that, but when it does go down the wrong pathways, it ends up robbing Peter to pay Paul. And in this case, we see a lot of people that are heavily dosed with sulfite. So they have sulfite intolerances, their hormones fall down. They're not making taurine, brain function goes down. And then also they're not making glutathione. So they're not reducing inflammation and reducing stress and signaling their, their detox pathways. Have you, has, does that make sense to you at all or yeah? It makes sense to me. I just, I, I, I love how you broke that down. You, you, you're basically bridging every single gap there and, and stating how it's having a, a ripple effect all downstream. And I was just, I was just picturing it in my head. I'm going like, you know, going down all the different pathways, which is great. I think BPC, um, yeah, I mean, it's probably having an effect somewhere down the line. Is it helping with liver function? Because we know that, BPC-157 is also being used to literally reverse pan, uh, ibuprofen or uh, Tylenol um, toxicity. It's literally been shown to repair the damage to the liver. So perhaps it's having some degree of um, detoxification property. But really, like, yeah, these compounds like BPC-157, um, there's so many. I mean, I could, I could just explore so many, like from the, from the GABA, from the GABA network, there's another one um, from traditional Chinese medicine, which I love to explore a lot of Chinese medicinal herbs as well. Um, in my spare time, I, I, I go down to this place called China Books and I read the the, China, the traditional Chinese medicinal textbooks. And just I just love how they view the body 
from like, um, you know, chi and energy and stuff. But there's a really cool um, compound from Chinese medicine from the herb uh, gastrodia. Um, it's called a uh, gastrodin. That one there has been shown. That's basically been used in like autism and um, and uh, Asperger's to help with ticks and things like that. Um, gastr- gastrodin, I think Life Extension. They used to stock it. They don't anymore. Um, that there has been shown to upregulate GABA production by like twenty to thirty percent. Um, so that's a really versatile yet yet again another strategy to utilize. Yeah, it's always interesting to talk to, and I say this with pure love, like your fellow geek, and talk to them about like science and, you know, mixing your chocolate with my peanut butter and coming with, you know, these different things. And, you know, when I think about this, I think about like one of the major inhibitors to all gene SNPs is inflammation, is oxidative stress, hydroxyl radicals, or just superoxides, all of these byproducts of the environment causing your smoke to come out of your chimney, if you will. And ultimately that will make um, something like BPC that much better, but it would also make something like the nootropic less in, in helpful because you haven't necessarily dialed down the basics and the fundamentals in way of inflammation because you're expecting that nootropic to be a magic wand, right? So does, does that happen a lot in that world? I, I, I really am ignorant in that world. Does that happen a lot where maybe some of these biohackers that have put the cart before the horse and they haven't realized that they need to get healthy before these can have the nootropic benefit. Does, does that happen a lot? Oh, for sure. And it's funny you mentioned that because my next, my next video is talking about modafinil. Um, the drawbacks, it's a very commonly abused um, <clears throat> uh, anti-narcolepsy drug. So it increases wakefulness and alertness, but that's a perfect example. They'll use modafinil in place of high quality sleep then three weeks down the line, when they've run out of modafinil or they take a break, they are going to feel absolutely horrendous. They're going to feel extremely depleted, exhausted, and burnt out. Um, and that's a common mistake. You know, there's a lot of people that fall into that trap when they enter into the nootropic space. And you know, when I started about seven years ago, like exploring this. You know, I, I I ran into that mistake myself. So really, um, the best way to infuse these compounds and nootropics is to work with your already healthy baseline lifestyle. Um, and like we could talk for hours about the benefits of sleep. And I know you've spoken about it quite a lot across your channels. Um, but I think, yeah, look, I think the future lies in how can we get the most deep and restful sleep possible using not only our blue blockers and um, temperature and environment and foods, but also which nootropics can facilitate improvements in REM sleep, which nootropics can facilitate improvements in deep sleep and reduce awakening awakenings and things like that. I think that's a really exciting area. Um, yeah. yeah, for sure. And I almost think about it as you can put it into a quadrant or just threes where I would say, uh, quadrant where you have the very, very unhealthy. And then you have the, on the far end, the very, very healthy. And then in the middle, you have the not so unhealthy and the not so healthy. If we can divide it into four quadrants, and then each one of those quadrants would A, have different out, uh, go, outputs or um, end results that you'd be looking for that would differ, right? Yeah. And then at the same time, um, all of them would have a certain Goldilocks zone of not too little, not too much. And mm. I think that's, I don't, that would be a really good idea for uh, understanding, like, cause I know with someone with the challenges that I have, I would love to give them a magic wand and give them this amazing product and have that undo years of stress and buildup of toxins and chemicals, but it's not. 
And ultimately I say, okay, well, we could layer that in. We want to remodulate your brain. We want to kind of get you to be less inflamed and ruminating, but we're not talking about the guy over here that's super healthy and is going to get the most designer cosmetic effect out of it. Can you want to speak a little bit to that? Yeah. Um, what you, I think, yeah, what you're touching on there is, is, is paramount. Um, so it's almost like you got to earn the right to use it. It's like, you got to do the work. You got to do the work with the foundations first. And then you've earned the right, the privilege. It's almost like something to look forward to. Um, it's like if you've done the grunt work, the groundwork, and you've honed in, you nailed your diet and like you're, you're on point with things like that, then perhaps your incentive and motivation will be, oh, I know that I'm going to get to 80% here just with all of these things alone. And then the the icing on the cake will be something like you know bromantane or other things like that that can help just improve what you've already built upon and the thing is a lot of these nootropics actually require you to have zero nutrient deficiencies they require you know um, healthy uh, digestion they require healthy detoxification they require sufficient hydration exercise to actually work properly so really they're actually going to be losing money by purchasing a, a nootropic at the wrong point in that um, phase, because if they're going to deploy it at the wrong time, they're not going to get the most bang for buck. So I think, yeah, definitely a good point. Yeah. And you know what, taking that one step further as well, we do this, sometimes patients will ask, well, how do I know if I'm getting better? And I think you can say objectively, like you look at test one and it shows you have X amount and text two shows you have more or less, which the direction you want. That's one way. Another way would be, you tell me, Mrs. Jones, like you remember, like you weren't sleeping before. Now you are. And some people get amnesia about that right they forget like oh my gosh you're right i remember when it was so bad so you gotta have to remember that but what i was gonna say sometimes lucas is with the application of what you just mentioned some supplements i love the idea you have to earn the right for it to be effective for you some people i'll put on supplements and like oh i've done that before and it didn't work and i'll say well did you do it with this 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 and this and that like no and like well then you haven't done it before and actually, this is what I want to show you is, is that let's not do it. Let's do this, 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 and this that we were going to do with it. We'll implement that. And then one of our benchmarks for improvement will be when you bring that back supplement back in, it's not going to be, it didn't work for me or it made me worse. It's going to be, oh my gosh, I felt like it made me better or I noticed the improvement. And that's what I tell people is that's not only a great sign of you improving, um, but it's also a fact that um, the reality is, is that you weren't ready for it before and you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and cross it off your I'm never going to do that again list because you just weren't ready for it. I think that's a huge, deep rabbit hole we went down to. Uh, to. Do you, what, what do you think about that? Oh, absolutely. Like I was just thinking now, like how many times I've said to myself, I'm going to revisit this in six months. I'm going to come back to this in six months. Because again, like, and even the way that you describe that where it's almost like we are molding the body, we're actually, the body is malleable, like we can fixate and, and change it in a way to then receive the input, sorry, the external um, compound in different ways. So it's like, yeah, I think, um, and even the point there, basically on, um, you, may, you may not have been ready at the time, but I'll add one to that is that even um, the, the actual quality of the product or perhaps the um, brand or the way that the herbs extracted can have a completely different effect. For example, with a um, classic adaptogen rhodiola, which you know, I've spent years researching and d d diving into what it does in the brain and things like that. When we look at rhodiola, it's broken down into various constituents the ones, salidroside is one of them and uh, rosamine is another one that people will talk about. Now, what's key to understand is that this rhodiola that was manufactured by this company will, can have a completely different effect to this rhodiola manufactured by this other company. And that may be due to um, the way in which they did the extraction. You know, was it alcohol-based, eth uh, ethanol, ethanol, water, jewel, whatever, um, that there is going to have a significant effect on 
how that person responds. And I've tried this with, I went through various, um, uh, shilajits is another herb that I love. And I went through like six different types and only one of them had like a profound increasing effect on energy and things like that. So I think one point to stress is that um, not only does our individual biochemistry matter, but the individual makeup of the herb matters. The, the herb itself has energy. And so how has the energy um, customized or, or put together in a way to suit your body? Like, is it, because, you know, you might hear Jack from down the road say, I tried rhodiola, it didn't work. Um, or it actually made me too stimulated. Whereas John said that oh, rhodiola was actually calming. What are you talking about? Like it was actually relaxing. You know, that's where it comes down to that intricacies and in um, extraction quality and things like that. Yeah, I mean, that's where you have to be the astute clinician to know like, okay, like, was it bad or was it bad? Or did we just we didn't do enough of a micro dose because I find that's the other thing too, is, is that all of a lot of people that are very sensitive, we look at them as their mast cell activated and the least little bit of fairy dust will put them, you know, like over the top. And so they'll tell me like a lot of the times, like it was good the first time, but then after that, it wasn't. And it's like, well, why, why did you take it the second time? You were feeling good, right? Like, well, I was told I need to do it every day. Well, no, like you want to think of it as riding a wave you caught a wave. Why are you coming off of the wave that you're already on? You don't need to get greedy. You're on a wave right now. You feel better than you did. That's one strategy. But the other strategy is you took too much and you need to microdose that. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater in that regards, especially if we've done a good workup. We've looked at the research. We know what's going on specifically with your body. And this is indicated. Does that make sense? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's a it's a brilliant concept and we could, it would be fun to, it'd be fun to just generally like sit down with a, a range of practitioners to see how they go about handling that or like what they do in that situation. Um, and something there that you mentioned, like with the microdosing aspect in terms of like, um, I was having a look at different dosing protocols, not just for nootropics, but just in general for supplements. And I'm thinking, all right, so we can do every day, we can do every second day, we can do um, like twice a week, we can do pulsatile dosing. It really does depend on, and I've even got supplements that I'll use once a month. I've got things that I'll use once every two weeks as like a resetter. Like there's so many different ways you can go about um, dosage protocols. Like I've got really strict criteria personally, just for myself, um, for when I'll use metformin. Not that I need metformin, but if I want to binge and have, you know, go out and have some sweets and, or if I um, have a super late night and I'm up till 2, 3 a.m., which I know I wasn't supposed to do and I know it's going to hurt my biology, well, that's maybe when I do bring in something heavy hitting like metformin to offset the deleterious effects of the way I lived, you know? So, time and place. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's part two, because you read my mind, because I was going to ask you about the biohacking with AMPK and metformin and, I, you know, getting into autophagy and getting into mTOR, because I'm going down that pathway right now, just for your interest is, I like the concept of mTOR, which is growth and building and re generating and building um, and then nerf two with antioxidants coming in and modulating that and kind of like almost like you know what it is it's like in our backyard we have automatic sprinklers and it wakes me up in the morning but I know like once it's about past the zone in the backyard it's going to the zone in the front and then it's going to the zone in the side and I think we have to think about carrying on from what we just talked about is the Zen and the art of supplementation, right? Because we are so paradigm to the three squares, three times a day, you know, like however we do it till the cows come home, like, hey, Lucas, this is a forever like ground in granite, like death sentence for the rest of your life to take this supplement. When in effect, you said it really succinctly earlier on, like my strategy is okay, understanding what, what the goal is right? What the goal is, but also knowing like, what are, what are your stressors on a daily basis? What's your physiology? And, and how can we modulate the, the knowledge that you need 
to harness that and use it when you need to and not use it when you don't. So that analogy of when the sprinkler system goes on, um, you have distinct mTOR days where you're thinking about protein, methylation, um, all the carbohydrates, just growing, strength training. Then you go into Nerf 2 and what modulates the, the, the balance between the two and you start doing more sulforaphane stuff and glycine and, and things that sort of support that transsulfuration pathway. And then you go into autophagy and stimulate AMPK. Ha have you looked into that at all as well yourself? Oh, for sure. I was just uh, literally, I have a joke with one of my, um, one of my naturopathic buddies. Um, we are uh, like, we just know because we're on the same wavelength. We just joke about uh, like, Hey, doing today, man. And he's like, yeah, just having one of those amp K sort of days, you know, or like, <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what the thing is, is like, I think bodybuilders, cause I come from that background to some extent in terms of they were some of the and not the original biohackers, but like say the 1980 biohackers, right? Where they understood uh, about just uh, cyclic training. I think body, yeah. I've got a lot of um, like nerdy bodybuilder friends that are like really, really well versed in terms of like understanding hormones um, and understanding pharmacology as well, because they're using such powerful um, performance enhancing drugs. They need to be, very switched on with how to use them and so in doing so they have to learn the biology first to to then use them um yeah i think you can take a lot from them and unfortunately they get like a really bad rap like a lot a lot of them in general like although i must say majority of them do have that very abusive mindset which does really um turn me off and it not it's just i think it's really I think it's frowned upon um, and I think it should be because they, they, a lot of them can be very abusive and more is more like they, they just want more and more and more. So I think that, and you're never happy if I'm making some bold statements, but like bodybuilders will never be happy because they're always seeking, um, you know, progression and um, they'll look in the mirror and they're always wanting more and more and more. So that mentality is just depleting them over time. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing that happens at the cellular level. You need to have a Cinderella, a Goldilocks zone where you're not doing too much, you're not doing too little. Same thing happens at the 30,000 view foot level. Like you just can't get greedy with things. Um, I, I look at that in terms of sort of the same concept when you are exercising and you are needing to balance your rest days. And you got to remember, I mean, really at the end of the day, this is to make your life better. I got trapped in that in terms it's no longer the means it becomes the ends and that's not a fun life to live if you're doing something for the ends of it and not the means for it to get you somewhere that's where you've lost sight of why does that yeah. make sense oh for sure yeah yeah so well listen i mean i definitely want to save a part two because i i want to get into the the whole ampk and 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 what that means in terms of um helping your body recycle its cells and go into fasting sort of mimicking things i'd be interested to know your take on that and blood sugar but that's a whole other podcast so as far as i always like to ask and respectful for your time um we definitely went through some holes we weren't expecting at the very beginning. Um, but what would you tell other people who um, maybe, um, or what would you tell maybe the younger Lucas now that you know what you know um, in terms of nootropics and cosm cosmetic neurology and balance in life and, you know, the tools of the trade that you know now that the bright eyed and bushy tailed Lucas didn't know about? Well, actually, one thing would be something that I've probably discovered at the start of lockdown, um, <clears throat> and that is just how much of an impact being around your friends and being around a social circle can have on my quality of life. Just because just, at the start, I undervalued that and I thought that we can, we can hijack Again, this is just me thinking that I could hijack my well-being with cosmetic neurology and outperform the environment just myself. But really now I'm understanding like 
I felt my happy, my happiest and most content and, and just generally alive when I'm with people that I, I feel connected to and are on the same wavelength, not the same 5G wavelength, but the same, <laughs> the same wavelength. Um, yeah, just, just looking back, if I were to tell myself, just don't underestimate the power of your social environment. That's probably the biggest one for me. Yeah, I mean, that's where the term buzzkill comes into play, right? Number one. And number two is I think from the Beatles quoted it the best is they get high with a little help of their friends, right? I mean, if you have the wrong set of friends, you can have a bad nootropic trip. And, and that goes into also what you said earlier in terms of it's just not how the impact it's going to have on you, but it's also how it's processed and it's utilized. But it's also what's your mindset going into it? And what's your, you know, what's your, your circumstances and what kind of stressors are you trying to get away from and how inflamed are, and yada, yada, yada. So anyways, listen, I enjoyed you being here today. Um, I learned certainly a lot. Um, I'd love to have you back for part two, if that's possible. And, um, but how do our listeners find out more about you, Lucas, and find out where you are online and, and what you do and the courses you, you offer? Yeah, awesome. I'd, I'd be more than happy to come back on for part two. Def definitely. A lot of topics we, we you know, could talk for hours about. Um, but for those listening in, they can find me um, on YouTube if they search Boost Your Biology on YouTube. Um, and also Instagram, they can search my brand, ergogenic underscore health. Got some really amazing free content there. Um, and then I've also got my own website, um, ergogenic.health. Got some cool products. And I've also got some courses as well. I've got a a very comprehensive cosmetic neurology course, a nootropics course. So guys, um, if you like that whole concept and you want to learn more, there's a whole course there people can dive into. Awesome. All right. Well, good. What's, and then what's next for you? What's the, listen, I didn't tell the readers cause I thought this was mightily impressive as well as you're doing all of this when you're not even just graduated yet. Is that correct? Yeah. This Thursday is my final clinic session. So I'll be graduating in like three weeks. So awesome. yeah. congratulations. But I think that's a testament to you to say, hey, I already know what I want. And I'm just learning and doing at the same time, which is awesome, which is great. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. So awesome. Okay. Well, listen, uh, I appreciate your time and I wish you future success. And I will be calling on you again, Lucas, to do part two. Um, and uh, nothing but success for you in the future. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Joel. Thanks. Thanks, buddy.